Broncos have taken Super Bowl 50. Dear Broncos and Hello no BS. again, Broncos, Broncos country. country. Welcome really to the Broncos. Broncos. Orange Weekly. No politics, just football. Welcome to another weekly edition of Orange Weekly After Dark. My name is Jason. I'll be with you tonight. And joining me once again is the one and only Kevin. I'm officially 0-2 to my superior brother in fantasy football this year, Dan Dino. Uh, Kev, minus the fantasy football loss, how are we doing tonight? You know, there's always next year. And uh, we're going to wait and see how I answer that, depending on how uh, Stefan Diggs does. And I, I'm really hoping that uh, he just doesn't make any more catches because otherwise I'm not going to make it to the playoffs in any of my leagues, uh, much like the Broncos the last three years. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how that how that all ends. But no, it's going to be here. I mean, Broncos win. It's a victory Monday. Um, it was an interesting game uh, I was at, and there were some, definitely some things that we need to talk about. But of course, as usual, I want to hear what everyone else has to talk about. Post your comments and questions. We got Travis Cheryl and Julio in here, uh, some some good fans. So, hey, guys, hit that share button for us. But, yeah, Jason, yeah, let you start, man. Sorry, it looks like you uh, broke up on my end a little bit there. Can you repeat that last part? Yeah, no, uh, go ahead and start with uh, all your initial reactions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was, uh, again, like you said, it's a win, uh, and those are hard to come by these days. And so uh, anytime the Broncos are able to scrape by with a win uh, is is definitely a positive no matter how ugly it was um you know it seemed to be uh the typical pattern of the broncos football team uh for most of the part of this year is uh jumping off to that that hot start uh jumping out to that two possession lead uh you know two score lead um and all of a sudden things go cold um and i'm sure our fans might have some some input on what might be the reason behind that um i have my own thoughts and opinions for sure uh, but clearly there's, there's a pattern here. That's not a good pattern, um, that you like to see in, again, the Broncos getting off to that good start. And then after that first quarter, um, can't seem to get anything rolling after that. So, uh, it's tough, but, uh, again, you're at the game. Um, let's obviously the biggest story is Drew Locke, uh, mm-hmm. again, his first start and his first win with that start. Um, always hard to tell on the TV exactly how he's doing. I thought he did okay. Um, I said those two touchdown passes, one largely thanks to Sutton making that just unreal catch uh, for sure. Uh, through that interception, uh, definitely missed some reads. Uh, wasn't the most accurate from what I saw, but uh, again, you were at the game. You had the bird's eye view. Uh, what did you see? What impressed you? What didn't impress you? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, Sutton made that that catch there, but, you know, Drew Locke did put it in the in the place it needed to be for him to make that catch. So it was a very good one, two punch there. Um, you know, it was, it was frustrating. Uh, you you got to keep in mind that he didn't, th- he didn't throw a ball for at least in, in any official practice capacity for upwards of 10 weeks. And up until two weeks ago is when he finally started doing that, you know, so he's trying to develop that chemistry with, with the team and the, and the players. Um, but there were a couple passes that were just, nowhere even close i mean a couple times he had an open man and he just it wasn't even close man um and, you know there's some uh, there's some things that obviously he needs to clean up but look his first nfl game he was a little nervous at first um so you got to give him some credit am i impressed by any means no am i disappointed by any means no uh so this is still uh, look we have one data point you know i'm not going to sit here and say he he's no good i can't say that he's 
fantastic and he's going to be the answer. So uh, it's it's going to take, you know, the next four games until we kind of have a really good answer as to what's going to happen. But there are definitely some things he needs to clean up. Now, some of it, you know, he had 126 pass yards at the end of the first. Now, 30 of those were at that very last play at the end of the half where it was just garbage time, you know. Um, still 126 yards, but then he ended the game with 134 yards. So he only got eight yards, you know, in the entire second half. Uh, and that says something, some of it's play calling, playing to lo- uh, playing not to lose or playing to win. I'm sure we can get into that, but yeah, man, it wasn't terrible. Um, but when you have 20,000 fans that don't show up to the game, um, you know, we've been through this cycle how many times, you know, Simeon's going to be the next answer. Paxton Lynch is going to be the next answer. Uh, Case Keenum, he's going to be here for the long haul. Uh, Joe Flacco will hold, a, hold us through. I mean, we've been through this time and time and time again. Uh, and so just, well, I'm going to wait and see, but I'm not, uh, I'm not overly optimistic. Yeah, uh, I agree. And uh, unfortunately, I think all that's uh, being done right now is more questions are being raised than answers uh getting shown to us um you know i I have a feeling that even if we see drew lock through these last four games now um i do have a a gut feeling right now that we're going to be drafting another quarterback uh in this upcoming class and um just because i don't know if you can really get a good feel on a quarterback through five games if he can be your franchise quarterback or not um and so We'll, we'll see, but I, I, I have a feeling that um, come next preseason, we're going to have another quarterback battle on our hands. And Locke definitely has uh, the position to lose. I mean, it, it's in his hands. He has the advantage of having a five-game head start on whoever comes in next year for the Broncos. But um, I definitely wasn't blown away, um, as we have seen with previous uh, court rookie quarterbacks. Uh, most notably recently, you know, Patrick Mahomes, his rookie year, even... Um, Lamar uh, Jackson, uh, he wasn't stellar his first year, but definitely had uh, a solid performance. Um, got took the Ravens to the playoffs, and uh, um, this year he's been in my book the MVP. And so, you know, that that's kind of what you're looking when you're looking for a franchise quarterback. It's not necessarily someone that just blows everyone out of the water right away, but someone that shows enough right away to go, okay, this is our guy. He's going to develop into an elite quarterback versus another quarterback we have right now where who knows i mean yeah he had some flashes he had some good throws uh but at the same time he had an equal amount of uh poor play uh for sure so lots of lots of still on cover with lock and and what his strengths are and, and if those like you said if those misses when miscues were just because he hasn't practiced that much with the first offense this season uh or if it's just who he is as a quarterback he's going to get over anxious on a lot of those throws but uh everyone watching thank you tonight uh for joining in uh, as always, please feel free to post your comments and questions and discussion points below. Get your thoughts on what you saw in Locke um, or anything else that you want to discuss. Uh, right off the bat, especially since this might be a bit of a shorter show tonight, though, uh, we haven't been able to give away many of these this year. But hey, with the win comes a wonderful Orange Weekly After Dark Mile High salute. So, uh, Kev, who do you got? I'm going to steal him. I know who you're going to pick. I'm going to, you're going to give him to me first? Okay. My high salute to Cortland, uh, Cortland Sutton because, holy crap. That, I mean, those two first, t- uh, the two touchdowns, especially that first one, I mean, there's no way that anyone else could have made that catch. Uh, you know, and it's it's disappointing that that's kind of what we're at right now. Uh, other players did well, but he was he's definitely the go-to guy. He's really our only go-to guy, and he's been playing clutch. Um, but that game would not have been won. It wouldn't have been close if it if hadn't been for him. So he definitely gets a big mile high salute. All right. Uh, looks like Travis, he's given his mile high salute to Drew Locke. Uh, you, you guessed wrong, uh, to be fair. I was not going to give really? mine to Sutton. Uh, I was actually going to go on the other side of the ball. And uh, someone who has continuously impressed me this year, but I think he was all over the place this game, was our linebacker. Jackson getting the mile high salute from me. I mean, that guy has been a true diamond in the rough. I mean, great find by Elway, uh, passed up by every other team in the league, uh, looked over and definitely addressed a position we were very weak going into this season. And man, that's even good. And I think this past game, 
he uh man he was all over the place he was breaking up plays he was stopping the runs he was tackling everyone that got near him hard hitting i mean that guy kept that defense motivated despite that second half performance on our offense uh when our defense had to keep going back out time and time again he uh he kept the, the guys motivated by those big time hits and yeah. uh you know scott's got a good point uh if i had to give another mile high salute it is to Derek wolf um obviously the news coming out today it was a dislocated elbow um so he's out for the season which is tough uh it's a big blow for uh, an already injury riddled defense um but wolf uh man that guy is a beast as it is uh he play uh, the fact that he came back after that high ankle sprain earlier this yeah. season um just shows you the the amount of pain tolerance that guy has the amount of heart that guy has so um everything i've read about the guy uh i'm sure he's just going to be devastated that he won't be able to play out uh the rest of the season so uh Derek wolf i know you follow us so it, he it does up and you're watching in, in your uh recovery time uh big mile high salute from all of us here at orange weekly for your dedicated play in and out uh week in and week out yeah um it's you've definitely become one of my favorite broncos um and definitely uh, as Travis says, prayers for a quick recovery for you. I'm excited to see you back on the field next year, hopefully still with that Broncos orange and blue. Uh, Kev, um, let's let's dig a little deeper. What What is it about this team that gets us going to such great starts week after week, for the most part, uh, great starts, uh, getting out to leads uh, by two or more touchdowns, and then going flat what what do you think it is um at least what do you think the main problem is and how how can we address it moving forward and and scott we want to get to your point here in a second but uh, jason it's an, it's an easy answer we play and jay I, jay you might want to turn down your volume but, well it's weird there's some feedback somewhere um we play to not lose you know we play to win we get that lead and all of a sudden we play like we have a lead we stop that attack you know, we were up 14-0, and then there was a, a drive there where we ran Royce Freeman um, three times up the middle. Uh, you're 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 being too conservative. You're not looking. You know, Drew Locke already had that connection to Cortland Sutton twice. He made some passes, but now you're just being too too laid back, and that goes to play calling. Um, and, and you see what was going to, I'm sure you guys saw the tweet and the, the news going around, but at the end of the game, apparently Scangarillo wanted to just kneel the ball and take it in halftime. And that's when Fangio stepped in and said, no, we're not going to end like that. Let's give us a shot. Let's see if we can make something happen positive for us. And that's when uh, Scangarillo dialed up that long pass that got the uh, pass interference that moved the ball in the field goal range for us. But that's exactly the mentality on the offensive side is, we get the lead. Okay, let's let's not try to get any more points. Let's just play it safe. And that's been the story all year long. These guys on the offensive coordinator side of things have got to step up. You cannot be playing like this. You have to take those chances throughout the entire game. There's no team out there with a winning record that plays with the same mentality that our offense does. There's none. I guarantee it. Every losing team probably has something of that where if they do get a lead, they're so scared to lose it that they just play play way too laid back. And they play to not lose, and that's when they end up losing more often than not. And that's exactly what our situation is. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree with more with that. Um, I feel it's not... I should speak volumes uh, on uh, this issue and... Um, I know Jared, who is on our Orange Weekly team, and I were kind of going back and forth in our group discussion yesterday um, because I, I was being pretty hard on Skangarell, and, and to my defense, I think rightfully so. I, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's painful to watch. You know, you have a rookie quarterback who's already thrown two touchdown passes to Sutton. So Sutton is obviously beating his man quite often. Drew Locke is able to deliver that ball into the end zone, which we've seen Throughout this year, we've struggled in that red zone efficiency, and we have a quarterback who has already stretched twice in the game. We get the ball in basically the twenty yard line, like you said, three run plays up the middle. Like, what are you are you kidding me right now? You can't figure out one pass. Yeah, sure, he might throw an interception, but guess what? He's thrown two touchdown passes already. Why not 
throw a chance for a third instead of like you said, well, if nothing else, at least we get three points out of this. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a tough mentality and, um, you see it, I think week after week, we've seen it going into the second half and sure the defenses are going to make adjustments. That's fine. But you know, at the same time, why stop what's working, uh, before you have to, you know, if it's, if your game plan is working and the defense make adjustments and then stones walls you, then, okay, let's draw something different up, mm -hmm. but to go up quickly two sc two scores. And then all of a sudden go to, okay, we've got to change everything. we got to, throw, we got to dial down our playbook. we got to play these, these stiff plays, but at the same time, what's also interesting to me with this, uh, play calling situation is he's not always conservative. It's he's conserved at the wrong times. You know, yeah. I mean, how many third and ones now that are two that come to mind very recent in the past couple of weeks where it's a third and one, the smart play would be to give it to one of our running backs to get that extra yard. And he does up some crazy little flip play or have our tight end run in the backfield. Yeah. And it's almost like, Oh, they'll never expect this. Stop it. Right. Your exactly. running backs are getting three or four yards per carry. Right. Stop and, being and fancy. You know, we have, I feel like we have an offense corner right now who's trying to play four dimensional chess when the other team's defense is playing checkers. I mean, yeah. he is, he's trying to think so far into the minds of the other team instead of just doing what works. What is working in this game right now? What is, what are, what is making us successful? What is not? Let's keep to it. Let's be conserved at the right times on those third and ones where we can keep the clock moving. But if we're in the red zone, first in, first down, one of those plays should probably be a pass play, you know? And so I don't know. I, I do think that he's going to be very closely looked under the microscope for these last four games. Uh, Scangarello that is. Right. Um, and we'll see. I think the Bronx are going to have a tough decision this off season um, on whether to keep him or not. Cause again, he is a first year offensive coordinator and I do think overall he's gotten better this year, but uh, shoot, I've been, I've been harping on this since way back at the green Bay game. Um, I was, I was complaining about Scangarello before it was cool to do. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, um, so it's it's going to be interesting to see what they do with that offense coordinator position, yeah. um, especially as, you know, the the usual coaching carousel begins come uh, January. Uh, Scott does say, you know, it's hard to figure out the coaching staff, but maybe we're not supposed to. Maybe that's, maybe they're just trying to trick all of us. Yeah, I mean, uh, and look, I mean, <laughs> we're not coaches. We're, we're not professionals. We, you know, but... All we are sitting here as fans, just trying to figure out what's going on. And when there's a pattern every single week, it's kind of easy to figure out what the issue is. Uh, but then trying to wonder, like, they've got to know this too. They've got to even, they've got to know this. So why aren't we doing anything different? And, and Tim says, yeah, we need to open up the whole game. Everyone knows this. The whole NFL, all the all of Broncos country knows this. So then why? Why do we stick to the same formula? We, you know, it's insanity. You know, it, it literally is the definition of insanity. And so, yeah, I, we can sit here and say we've lost two really good teams. Yeah, but we've put ourselves in the position to lose. We get these leads. We, we look really good. And then we come out second half. It's not so much that, you know, we don't make second half adjustments. It's that our, the, our only adjustment is we, we become too conservative. We play to not lose. And that's when we lose. And it's it's mind-blowing. Yeah, absolutely. And even Jared had, had the point where, you know, obviously if you didn't hear the, the news, you, you touched on it a, a little bit ago, but um, Scangarello wanted to take a knee at the end of the game just to get overtime. Uh, Fangio said he overruled him, said let's go for it. Uh, in of itself, with not much context, that's a pretty innocuous situation. Offensive coordinator saying, hey, let's do this. Head coach at the end of the game going, no. Let's do this, whatever. But I, I think in Jared's point in our discussion yesterday, what was interesting is that Fangio told that story. Um, Fangio at the press conference. Yeah, he basically threw Scangarello under the bus. It was weird. And I, and I think that points to they do see it and they're starting to run. Th now it's hard to justify firing an offense coordinator this part of the season. Broncos are out of the playoffs. We have an influx of quarterbacks going through the carousel. Uh, why fire an office quarter right now? I get that. That being said, I do think it shows there's a lot of tension within that group where Fangio's sick of it too. And keep in mind, Fangio's a defensive-minded guy, you know? And so the fact that Fangio is the one at the end of the game saying, hey, no, we're going to go for this. And then taking that story and, and giving it to the press afterwards, I think shows that to a certain degree, at least, 
he's got to be frustrated with this situation um, as well. Um, let's take a quick break, Kev. Um, why don't you jump into our Patreon um, and what our fine followers and viewers can get uh, if they help us out a little bit. Will do. So give you the short version guys we got shows for you throughout the week we got this show monday night we got tuesday night show bourbon broncos no bs 7 p.m mountain time every tuesday night we got a pre-game podcast post-game podcast you guys can follow those on spotify itunes or whatever your favorite uh podcast source is make sure you hit that subscribe button for us on those places so you know as soon as the uh the podcast drops uh we also got sunday shows for you i know we missed all the last sunday shows i was at the game I uh, wasn't able to get a good enough connection to do any of those live shows, so um, uh, my apologies. But yes, uh, this is—it was the only—it was the first halftime hash we had missed in the last three years. So apologize, guys. Uh, we're gonna try and make it another three years before we we miss another one. So, uh, but yeah, we got all this stuff for you guys. Uh, if you want to donate, Patreon.com. We're gonna be doing another giveaway. I think. Uh, Thursday or Friday night, uh, I'm going to be doing the next giveaway uh, prize drawing for those who donate to our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash orangeweekly or go to patreon.com and search for Orange Weekly, whichever way you prefer. Uh, hit that donate button and then uh, Thursday or Friday night, uh, we'll be doing that pr uh, prize drawing live on Facebook and Twitter and everything. So check that out. But of course, guys, as usual, we are here for you guys. This is why we do it. Uh, Jason and I, you know, and the rest of Orange Weekly staff, we talk Broncos football all the time. But the fun part is talking to you guys about it and hearing what your thoughts are. So uh, that, that makes it fun. And that's why we're going to keep doing it. Um, uh, Travis says, how about the Seahawks winning tonight? Uh, the only thing I want to touch on about that, Jason, is the NFC is loaded. The NFC playoff is, is going to be fantastic to watch. Really, all the AFC has is Baltimore and then the Patriots, whose offense is absolutely horrible, yet they, they find a way to win all these games because they have an easy schedule. Uh, but that's pretty much it for the AFC. But the NFC is going to is, is stacked. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see moving into the playoffs. Uh, you know, the, the top three that come to mind um, in the NFC, obviously, um, Seahawks, 49ers, uh, New Orleans is another top-notch team. Um, so we'll see. I, I do think it'll be um, a tough go-around for BAC this year uh, in the Super Bowl, but uh, time will tell for sure. Oh, um, one good thing. <laughs> Let's di Let me divert for just a second more. How about the Air Force Falcons? They were perfect at home this year. They finished 10 and two, best record since 1999, 98. Wow. Freaking phenomenal. Uh, and then you got that in the Avs. There's a lot of good uh, Colorado teams uh, doing well this year. So there's stuff to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. You know, the hey, Colorado sports is not dead yet. No. Um, and guarantee you there's going to be a resurgence for the Broncos here in the upcoming years. Uh, just a bit of a low time as every team goes through um it happens but we will see this through to the end by the way three three years plus with halftime hash yep. um that's that's almost von miller yep. numbers-esque as far Including as preseason uh, iron man streak that's uh man that's that's a else. that's a record um <laughs> Um, Scott has a comment. Um, I think this referring back to Scangarello. Um, I think it's the fact he's a young coach and has had multiple QBs. Remember Jimmy G was out last year. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, definitely a, a good point and, um, definitely. A, and I think this speaks to the entire staff is where they're a fairly young staff as far as years held, holding their position. You know, this is obviously Fangio's first time, um, as the head coach, Gangrel's first time um, offensive coordinator, a lot of first time coaches in this staff. Um, and so, you know, what we're looking into next year, one, I guess, part of it, the draft, um, but even long term uh, adjustments from a coaching standpoint, what would you like to see, whether that's strategic or, or just how the team is run, the message you, you would want the coaches to be bringing to the team next year? Um, as, as this first year is under their belts, what can they do, um, assuming they're all back next year? The, the first thing, and I think they Gangrel is going to get at least one more year. Um, the coaching turnover thing has got to stop. We've got to find some continuity. Um, the first thing that coaches need to do, especially Coach Fangio, needs to go back and look at all of his mistakes, all the times, like this last week, where 
you know, there's there's two minutes left and we run down 40, essentially 45 seconds of that, just standing around with three timeouts. Are you kidding me? At some point, nobody thought, oh, hey, the clock's running. If you don't have a play dialed up, even after the two minute warning, which I don't understand, but okay, fine. There's a miscommunication, new quarterback on the field. Somebody call a freaking timeout, you know? Um, things like that. There's just many, you know, there's a couple, you know, uh, misuses of timeouts and poor communication at times. And that's just something that they all need to get together and figure out how to prevent those mistakes moving forward. And Coach Fangio's first year, it doesn't matter if you have 20 years experience as assistant or as a coordinator, being a head coach is very different. Now, with that 20 years as a coordinator, that should give you more insight and knowledge into how to be a better head coach, but you've got to work through those yourself. That's the first thing they need to do. Second thing is, I don't even know if they need to bring something to the players. The front office has got to give them a direction. They've got to work with the coaching staff, especially Coach Fangio, to figure out what players he wants to bring on next year. But they've got to give him a direction. They've got to be saying, they've got to, there's something they got to do uh, to tell the, the coaching staff where they want the Broncos to go. That, that's what they need. Okay. After that, I think the coaching staff, Coach Biangio, is going to do a good job of explaining to the players, you know, what what that vision is and how to accomplish it. But I, I don't think it's anything that Coach Biangio is doing wrong, other than just those t- game management mistakes that he's made throughout the year, and you know, newbie newbie mistakes. So I can forgive him this year. Fair enough. He's got a little bit of grace this year. Um, something that is interesting that was raised to my attention earlier today, which I hadn't thought about. Uh, obviously, the Broncos started 0 4. That's the bad. We don't like to talk about that. But since then, Broncos are 4 and 4. Not terrible. I mean, we're 500 in the past eight games. Definitely not where we want to be. Um, but I, I see that as encouraging. Um, you know, it, it's to me a step in the right direction after you start, after you, how you ended the past couple seasons to start with. But then also how you began this year uh, to be able to kind of with all the injuries we have mind you and uh basically playing with a permanent handicap um with uh, uh garrett bowles out there um constantly killing drives for us um the fact that we're in four and four is not bad um again not where we want to be but hey um it's, it's 500 yeah it, it's a step in the right direction for sure <coughs> excuse me there um any other comments on your end that you're seeing? Yeah, we see uh, James says he sounds like uh, we sound like we could coach them. Um, yeah, James, I'm not saying that. Look, look, I know I would do absolutely no better. I would do way worse, you know, than, than Coach Fangio and, and company is doing. Um, but there are things that we expect from a head coach and, and coaching staff to, to do. Um, and you throw me in that situation. Oh, I'm not going to do any. I'm, I'm going to do absolutely terrible, like Vance Joseph level of terrible. Um, maybe a little bit better than him. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, th- there's just, there's just things that we expect from a head coach. And, and these are things that are hopefully when they go into the off season, they really examine what happened in each one of those games. Cause you know, they're going to break down every single game and where those mistakes were and what mistakes they made themselves. And so hopefully they take that, they figure out a way to overcome those or what to do in those situations, put those in their hip pocket and that's what's going to help them improve as the time goes along. But, uh, you know, Tim says the system is broken. Uh, the last three years jacked us, and, and it did. Between the bad drafts, you know, of, uh, was it 15 and 16 or 14 and 15, those terrible drafts, that's another reason we we're hurting so bad is we have no young depth. Uh, we're just now, after the last two years, starting to see some, some young depth. And that's what's helping us go in that direction. So we have to have another two or three years of really good drafts as well as free agency to really get this team kickstarted. Um, but uh, that's, uh, James says we're right. I hope I'm right, at least to some degree. I'm not always right, but sometimes. Uh, no, I appreciate it, James. But yeah, so uh, th- that's my thought, Jason, is just they're, they're easy mistakes or they're, they're mistakes that are easy to fix. Absolutely, yeah. Um, maybe for Christmas you could uh, send them a copy of that book. Oh, uh, that you- <laughs> well, you know, what? I might send Vance Joseph. He he might actually, if anyone needs to read it, it's probably him. <laughs> Here's what football is. 
is what a quarterback does. Fair enough. Uh, we're going to start wrapping things up, guys. Uh, but Scott asked a good question. Is Vic a laid back coach or does he just seem that way? I think he just seems that way. I, I think Vic is a very old school coach. Yeah. Um, and with that old school coaching comes a lot of um, rules, uh, rules and a set standard of this is how it's going to be done. Uh, there's no discussion about it. Uh, we are going to do it this way. If you don't like that way, there's the door type of mentality. Um, and I, I think we've seen a little bit of that. I, I think we saw a little bit in the preseason uh, when they were working arguably harder uh, as far as uh, amount of practices and duration of practices than most other teams that time of year. Um, even things like him not allowing uh, music to be playing while they were warming up during preseason. Getting focused. Um, and so I, I think he's laid back on the sideline because he's been there for quite some time he's been on the sideline for a while and so um i don't think he's phased very easily during the course of a game but i think as far as how he runs games uh or even how he runs the team um is probably if i guess a bit more with an iron fist than we've seen in the past several coaches that uh we've had between joseph even kubiak uh uh john fox um i, I think he pro he's probably the hardest coach um, but, but because of that, I, I would say that's why a lot of these players are respecting him is he's trying to bring back a culture of winning. And with that comes a very hard mentality to come with it. Um, but, um, and Travis making a comment, uh, Vikings trying to make a comeback. Uh, it is getting to be a close game. So we'll wrap up so our fans can watch the rest of that game here. Um, but before we go, uh, Kevin, you and I had a bet earlier this week, um, want to uh discuss this bet and the outcome of it i don't remember any of that <laughs> basically i said if drew lock i i bet that drew lock would not start uh and jason obviously took the opposite view of me and said that he would start and of course i was you know we made a bet because i haven't learned to this you know after 31 years i have not learned uh, that I, you know, of course, lost the bet. So, Jason, you were right. I was wrong. But let's see how Drew Lock pans out first. Uh, he started. You might win that bet, but uh, let's hold off on any real congratulations here. I, I mean, to be fair, I never said he'd be great or even good. I just said he was going to start. Uh, yeah, I know. And I know. I, you were, you were adamant he was going to start. I was rightfully adamant that he was. Uh, and... As per usual, uh, this Dandino was right. Um, but hey, that's neither here nor there. That's for future discussions. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, everyone, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, again, there's going to be plenty of content coming your way if you didn't get enough tonight. Um, feel free to come back, check out that uh, that content, our podcasts, our live shows. Uh, during that discussion, we've got the Texans coming up. It's going to be a battle. Texans looked really dang good against the Patriots, so it's going to be a very good challenge of, of the current state of the Broncos and for sure Drew Locke. So make sure you tune into all of our content as we prep you for that. Kevin, any final thoughts? Not really. Uh, Travis says mile height salute to all of us at Orange Weekly. We mile high salute to, of course, all you fans. And yeah, I'll be here tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Bring that bourbon, booze, beer, whiskey, don't care. Uh, bring some to drink, kick back, relax, and we'll talk to you tomorrow night. There we go. Lots of stuff for you guys. Enjoy the rest of your guys' night. Enjoy the rest of that great football game going on right now. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you later this week. Go Broncos. Go Broncos. Take care, guys.